Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's Furniture History Society event. My name is Kate Hay, and I'm co-chair of the events committee of the Furniture History Society. We're glad to welcome viewers from across the UK and abroad, and uh, thank you to the, all the other societies who've helped to spread the word about this event. Whatever your particular interest, welcome. It's great to have you with us. This evening's event will be Luke Hughes and Aidan Walker in conversation on the subject of arts and crafts in the digital age. Luke Hughes has devoted a lifetime to designing elegant furniture solutions for the UK's most prestigious buildings while developing a philosophy that defines arts and crafts in a contemporary context. Aidan Walker, himself a former, former cabinet maker, is a writer and editor who now curates, presents and chairs conferences and seminar programmes such as Art for Tomorrow for the New York Times and the content pro programmes for the Global Design Forum, Design Shanghai and Grand Designs Live. So welcome both of you. Um, in 2020, Luke and Aidan collaborated on this book, Furniture in Architecture, the work of Luke Hughes, in which they propose a socio-economic rather than a materials or historic based understanding of what furniture means and has meant in our lives. When in the 19th century, Morris, Ashby, Letherby and others confronted tasteless capitalist pr production, they provoked a range of questions about craft values in a mass market, which are still relevant today and are given further edge by the affordability of sophisticated production techniques, unthinkable only a generation ago. So over to you, Luke and Aidan. Thank you, Kate. Thank you very uh, much. Good evening, everybody, and um, welcome, and thank you very much for joining us. I see now we're up to 77 participants. Uh, I'm Aidan, and the guy in the library with the um, bust of Milton and a hat is Luke. Um, Luke and I have known each other many, many years. He's um, one, of the, one of my most valued friends, and to some extent, the introduction anyway, of this is a, is a little bit about the story of the book. Um, I was at a trade exhibition, uh, saw him in the distance, and he started waving a finger at me and saying, I want you to write my book. And I said, well, then I want to, too. Um, why we are calling the talk Arts and Crafts in the Digital Age is because that was the thing that kind of really got us going both. Um, Luke's, uh, it, will, it, it will develop, you know, over the next hour, you will be able to see uh, the kind of work that Luke Hughes and company does. Um, but he's, it's very significant that he views himself as very much part of the arts and crafts tradition. And uh, the many, many conversations we had while I was writing the book, in, which was all really all from live interviews with Luke, and obviously, you know, some research and indeed Luke's own archive, which is massive. Um, we, we, we really wanted to pin down the nature of craftsmanship and how digital technology has enhanced, really, not, altered, obviously, but also enhanced craftsmanship and made, uh, made small workshops much more powerful and capable of um, doing, of, uh, of, creating uh, not just small amounts of furniture, but medium to large amounts, something that we call mass batch production. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to look at some of the original arts and crafts stuff. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, Ruskin and Morris. Um, we're going to talk about machinery and the um, socioeconomic um, um, circumstances of the mid 19th century uh, with the great exhibition of 1851. Uh, we're going to bring it more and more up to date talking about uh, machinery that is used now in small workshops. Uh, we're going to ask Luke why he um, confines himself and the activities of his company almost exclusively to public buildings, very, very little actual private work. Um, we're going to have a look at some of the uh, design crimes that Luke Hughes and Company's furniture has solved. And then we're going to have a look at five particular projects out of um, when Luke and I were talking yesterday. Uh, Luke, tell us how many projects you've done since you started. Uh, 2,283, according to our database. <laughs> okay. So 2,283 projects, we've chosen five. I mean, there are actually only 25 in the book. And uh, although uh, Kate very kindly um, described the way that the book is written, in fact, it doesn't really address um, some of the issues that we wanted to address with it because 
uh, publishers are publishers, you know, and the thing is was is much more easily sold as a monograph. So my introduction, uh, the first introduction that I wrote, I had to basically junk and go all over again and do something entirely different. But uh, we're both very, very pleased with it. We're delighted to have um, a uh, forward by Tanya Harrod, who is a great name in, in crafts publishing, of course. And um, then let's take it away. Luke, Satanic Mills, I think, comes next, doesn't it? Uh, hang on a second. Yes, I think so. Yes, there we go. <clears throat> now, I've done enough talking. You better start now. Why don't you go ask me a question? <laughs> well, I mean, I think it is worth saying, as we all know, and it's a, it's some of these are old chestnuts, but they're sometimes they're worth roasting up a bit, um, that a lot of the arts and craft is associated with the rejection of the dehumanizing effects of industrialization. But it's quite interesting that Blake, who, who coined the phrase dark satanic mills, actually wrote it and published it um, uh, in the hymn Jerusalem um, in 1808. So a long time before some of the economic uh, catastrophes during the 19th century, and certainly a long time before the arts and craft movement really gets going in the 1880s. Um, but I do put these slides in as much as anything else, partly to show that it's not just the Chinese and the Indians who had pollution problems, um, but the dehumanizing effect of the industrialization was very, very real. Um, and we'll touch a little bit more, I think, Aidan, in the conversation about he who controlled the capital and why it set up this, um, this uh, uh, extraordinary economic imbalance. Um, Indeed we are. We're going to get there, but first of all, we're going to have a look at John Ruskin, aren't we? I think we are going to look at the man who, who kicked it off, or articulated it, I think. Um, yeah, R um, Ruskin with the, um, the Stones of Venice, uh, the famous chapter in, I think, the second volume, uh, is all about uh, the dignity of labour. And that is something that uh, I know runs very much through Luke's own philosophy, and was... Um, comparatively revolutionary at that time because the whole idea of um, of a, an industrial working class was extremely new it was literally it, it, you know it was just coming into being so um, the kind of uh, humanized and humanistic impulses that employers have to um, have to work with now none of that kind of stuff actually existed and it was it was very very hard hard work and as Lucas said very dehumanizing so Ruskin's uh, Ruskin and then obviously Morris you know took uh, his cues uh, from Ruskin's own philosophies about um, about the dignity of labor and particularly about the dignity of craft the hand in work mind to God all those good things um, we um, Luke am I going to ask you to move the slides on or do you I want think, to move it? yes I think that's the way it's going to need to work I think this might help prompt that conversation a bit because the dates are quite interesting the the painting top left is the Millet very famous painting both of them are in the tape actually and both of them are exactly a hundred years apart but the principle is there there was Millet and the Pre-Raphaelites describing in paint that something about the dignity of labor I think in that very arts and craft proto arts and craft interior in, um, of Christ in the house of his parents um, and there's everything there the sheep behind the wattle doors there's the tools the wonderful treatment of the hands the hands of Joseph the carpenter and the assistant um, and the shavings on the floor. By contrast the Lowry um, um, uh, which is more or less that black and white photo but laid down in paint but you do get that very clear sense that the romanticism came through in the painters. And it's quite interesting the extent to which Ruskin of course championed um, the pre-Raphaelites. So this is good 30 years before the arts and craft movement gets going um, as a movement. Um, but it is also interesting about the dates because I think I'm right that Marx wrote Das Kapital in 1859 or thereabouts. So there was a lot of movement in this which was getting articulated not just in art but also in social commentary. I think the next one perhaps kicks that one off. Hey, do you... <clears throat> well, this is about capitalism, isn't it? I mean, with the, with the next picture that's coming, which is about the Great Exhibition, which is 1851. So we're right in the middle of the 19th century. Um, the image to the left is the McCormick Reaper, the first um, mechanical reaper, which uh, allowed the incredible amount of uh, grain from the American Midwest to be harvested 
with extreme efficiency and um and obviously brought to the uk with the whole uh, corn laws and the um econo the social and economic upheaval that that that, that flood of cheap grain caused um, the two machines, the planing machine, and what's the lower one, Luke? The um, it's also it's another planing machine. It was it was actually from an exhibition catalogue from the eighteen sixties. Right. So what what we can very very easily see is that this is not these kind of um, uh, machines are not for the single or you know three four man workshop. This is heavy 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 capital, and that's why. Um, furniture at that at this time, as it be, as it began to get um, industrially produced, was really only in the domain of uh, of people with with big capital, capitalists, obviously. I and think it's I, also worth pointing out about McCormick Reaper because what it did, it changed the agricultural economics. People who had been working on the land suddenly were when were, were were no longer as valuable as they were, and that pushed them into the industrial um, into the industrial centres as well. It was huge, huge upheaval. That with the ability to move stuff around the world with steamships coming on and railways and canals, um, it really did shift the whole of the economic balance. Indeed, it did. Um, that some of the research that we did um, uh, for the book it was looking at the growth of um, uh, urban centres like Manchester and and indeed some um, like um, Buffalo, New York, for instance. You know, which in I believe just from memory in 1842 had a population of. 10,000 and in 1870 had a population of of 100,000 or 200,000. I mean, um, urban centers were growing at a rate that that it's very, very hard to to imagine. Even today, looking at, for instance, at China's urbanization program, you know, the um, the social upheaval, the, the changes were absolutely um, earth shattering. They really were. Let's look at Morris and the exhibition loop. So here's a young Morris, age 23. Uh, and there's Paxton's amazing Crystal Palace, which in itself was a massive, massive industrial achievement for um, for the mid 19th century. There's a, an apocryphal story which um, we um, we like to talk, uh, we like to tell about Morris, which is he refused at the age of 17. I think he went with his family to the Great Exhibition and actually refused to go in. Although the apocryphal story is one about him having to uh, come outside and vomit in the bushes. He was so overcome with the ugliness of all this uh, vast um, industrial production. And that that is really the point, is that um, capitalists and the industrial, the industrial bourgeoisie, call them, had overtaken the English landed aristocracy, um, which until then had been the most powerful social group in the world, um, all the land, all the money. Now all that changed and it made it very, very different but what what they weren't able to do was articulate taste, and this is where we we begin to see Morris and his and his arts and crafts cohorts trying to instill into well into mass production, and we'll come on to that how how actually um, it was a very very small um, but a highly influential movement of arts and crafts. Um, how that changed the way that the middle classes um, bought and valued. Um, furniture and furnishings. Um, the, I, I must say, I think this is a really very ugly table. This is actually Morris's own design um, in bottom right there. Um, truth of the matter is Morris wasn't that much of a furniture designer. He was much more of a textile and pattern designer. And um, I think the Art Workers Guild was started in 1884, Luke, is that right? Yeah, that's correct, yeah. So Art Workers Guild 1884, which was the kind of home of the arts and crafts movement, if you like, uh, in that same year, Morris was already um, um, campaigning for uh, a kind of radical social socialist um, reform. So by the time that the Art Workers Guild was was getting going, Morris's attention was turning much, much more away from design and um, bringing good taste to the masses towards um, political upheaval and political campaigning. Um, and more of his uh, more of his of his contemporaries. Um, it's actually Philip Clissett, uh, the gentleman in the middle, 
who designed the Sussex chair, which many people mistakenly attribute to Morris. On, on the right, we have Jimson, and there is our man Morris, um, age 53, on the left. So by this time, as I say, by the time of, of, he was 53, he was moving much more into politics. Art Workers Guild, Luke, you talk about that, please. Well, I think it's you mentioned that the Art Workers Guild was the sort of home of the arts and crafts movement then. Actually, I think it still is. And this is one of the extraordinary things. It's been going now for 135 years or so. I've been a member for 35 years, I think. Um, but the extraordinary thing about it, apart from the fact that it's never had a penny of public money, it's still in, um, it's still in, in Queen Square. But what is really extraordinary is all those early pioneers of the arts and craft movement and the architects, they all knew each other. They were all members of the guild um, and they were regularly meeting. It wasn't just, you know, uh, through the internet or Zoom or um, Teams or anything else like that. They were gathering fortnightly for lectures. Um, Philip Clissett's chairs, we've had a hundred of them in the guild and they were incredibly important that the about the integrity of return to the um uh, the dignity of craftsmanship if, if you like and they're always associated with um with jimson but they are actually clissett's chairs but down the right hand side of the list of the past masters which really is a batting list of of um english visual um life or, um since 1884 and there is gordon russell um, in the middle um, as a past master and everybody else there as well. They, but they all did know each other. And this is the other thing, the handshakes, if you like, is more than just a handshake. They met each other regularly. So it was very quick to disseminate some of, the, um, some of the information, some of the ideas. And I have to say, I mean, it is still very vibrant, the AWG, and the, the quality of the lectures is, is excellent. And I certainly, a lot of my visual education has come from um, being 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 a member. Ashby was, Gordon Russell was, Dick Russell was, um, but they were very much the next generation, if you like, the sort of early 1900s and 1920s and 30s. Um, and Gordon Russell, obviously, there was a group, huge debate amongst the Art Workers Guild um, and about practitioners about the extent to which machines could ever play a part. Um, Ashby was very much a purist and didn't really believe one should use them. Gordon Russell said, you, well, if machines are fine, you just got to teach them some manners, um, which I think is uh, an idea that I certainly, uh, I, I certainly subscribe to. But the other interesting point, and why it's worth just making a mention of Dick Russell, because he was Gordon's brother, and he worked um, uh, as an architect initially, but did actually come up with some wonderful designs for the firm. But this connection between the craftsmen and the workshops with the architectural world was absolutely fundamental. Uh, to those arts and crafts um, principles, early principles, and I believe still are. Um, the it's next very in your own work, isn't it, Luke? Also, say again. Uh, very important in your own work also. Well, it's become so, but I realise that actually one, one accumulates sort of their habits, but partly because of they feel familiar and, and, um, uh, and you feel comfortable within them, but also it makes sense. I mean, furniture has no function unless there's a building to put it in. Architecture has no function either, until, unless it's a monument, um, unless it's got a chair to sit on or a table to sit at. But you can kill a building visually and functionally if you put the wrong furniture in it. So it's not so surprising that there should be that, 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 that connection. Um, Peter Wells was there because he really sort of took it on with, uh, from, um, uh, from Jimson's workshop. He was actually Dutch, but it, he, he taught them all all in the workshops in the Cotswolds how to do it and went on to teach at Loughborough, as indeed with Edward Barnsley. Um, he didn't like using machines at all, but, but Edward Barnsley went on and the Barnsley workshops are still going. But the, one of the great um, uh, pupils, if you like, from Barnsley was Alan Peters, who was a phenomenally efficient, able craftsman who you and I both remember um, um, and in huge influence. But a lot of this was about very few people expressing quite a lot of ideas. Um, I suppose it's worth just mentioning that it is in, in the context of machines and indeed what, the, the theme of what you've been talking about. Basic hand tools haven't changed much in 2000 years. And the top left are, are the uh, planing machine, uh, the planes and chisels from the Mary Rose, which were dug up in the 1545. You'll find similar stuff in ancient Roman um, archeological digs and in ancient Egyptian ones. 
Um, but the thing that really has changed, even since I started making furniture 40 years ago, is um, small power tools. Um, and there you are, that's from Amazon yesterday, the cordless drill driver, 49 quid. I mean, it's a, you know an absolute snip. You can't, you can't fault it, really. In the middle there is one of the most useful tools of all, which is a router. Um, but you can mold and, and, and uh, run grooves and plane stuff with it. But you need the cutters. They're all now made with tungsten carbide. You can buy a set of 15 pieces for 18.99. That's about one pound 30 each. It's absolutely fantastic what is available now. You don't need that big capital that you needed, as was illustrated by the engraving earlier on and computers of course and now drive these things you can mount all these these all these cutters into a big machine like that and program it within 15 minutes rather than taking a day to set the thing up so batch production suddenly has become much more viable and a lot of these techniques have become much more accessible to small workshops um, than has ever been before and that is getting more so and not less so what is the one uh, just stay on that slide for a minute what is the um, the top right image there? Explain. Well, that's that's a big um, uh, multi um, multi. Now that's quite an expensive machine. I mean that that photograph I took about twenty years ago. In those days, they were costing about one hundred and twenty thousand pounds. But you can get machines doing all those various profiles and sanding and everything else all automatically. Now you can get them for about twenty five thousand pounds. So they're well within the, the reach of a relatively small workshop, a six, eight man workshop. Um, in, in, even in the 30 years or so that I've been, I've been making furniture. Technology really has changed everything as indeed has the computers and what we do with the drawing and getting it ready for production. But of course, the other thing in this is communication. We're now running projects all around the world because of um, iPhones. I mean, and, or, um, 15 years ago, we didn't have them. But I'm running projects from Washington, DC, and in China and um, Singapore, and we're doing it all using iPhones, non-stop, non-stop meetings, non-stop photo photographing drawings and doing the, during the conversation with everybody. It has completely changed what is possible to do with six or eight man workshop, um, which simply wasn't possible even 15 years ago. And I, you know, I, I, I rest the point because it's, um, it, we, the key on the, the why why these things are so relevant now is that it's never been more accessible to a small workshop than it is now. And but what of craftsmanship? Are we still saying that um... we still need the guys? You see, because this ultimate, I, you still need the person to put it together. You still need somebody to exercise judgment um, about what piece of timber is a good piece of timber rather than a naff one. You still need people who love it. And this is the big change, I think. And this is another thing that the 1880s, 18, 1850s, 1880s couldn't do. They were dehumanizing and taking the living away from people and making them slaves to the machine and slaves to the capital, if you like. And then this Marx had a point. The truth of the matter is most craftsmen are very intelligent and they may not be necessarily always very well educated, but they have brains in their fingers and they have an absolute love and passion for what they do. And by God, it makes a difference if you've got a workshop who like what they do and enjoy it. And they, it is it is absolutely fundamental. And I don't see that going to be changing at all. Um, we still need those guys. We still need that training, um, albeit one can take a lot of the drudge out of it with with by teaching the machine the manners that Gordon Russell so aptly described. So that's a pause. That's a pause. It goes back to uh, to the book. And it is the big theme in the book, isn't it, Aid? I mean, that's the yeah. one we wanted to write about. Absolutely, um, because... absolutely. And it's it, it's impossible to avoid it, really, when talking to you. You know. <laughs> well, I've but... been very lucky of working with very good craftsmen, you know, since I in my teens, um, and you get that flavour of the the passion that they have for it. And why any of us might get out of bed, if you like, in the, in, in the early morning is much more fun working with somebody who's in control of their own destiny, who can make some money and um, um, and enjoys what they do and will still be there tomorrow. Um, and it is possible if we can harness all that energy with 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 that dignity of craftsmanship there. I think the world is the world of of work and handwork has got a huge future. Yep, I don't disagree with that at all. Um, as you know, I'm fond of saying that like the key kind of element or the key component of craftsmanship is love. 
and you know it's love for the work love for the materials love for the process that's what keeps people um keeps people doing what they do and it's what it's what keeps people loving uh, well-made furniture as well i think and indeed the kind of uh, impact that furniture can have on buildings which is where we're leading um the next two or three are who we are and what we do. It's back to you, Luke, to tell us a little bit more about well, how just Luke to set the set context. Um, the company, um, which has been going for 35 years now, um, we design and make furniture for sensitive architectural settings. We tend to design for a 30 to 50 year life expectancy. You know, I have to say some of our stuff's already that old and is doing fine and will last a lot longer. Some of the big Oxbridge commissions certainly have a hundred year life um, expectancy, but they'll probably last much longer than that. But the fundamental principle um, or principles behind this is that the furniture should articulate and embellish that architectural space and not embarrass it. And we'll touch on that in a little while. But another is that keeping the building relevant, of course, we're shifting the way we use our buildings, ecclesiastical buildings in particular, in a rapidly changing world is ultimately down to the quality of the furniture. You can't always change the building, you can change the furniture. Clients include um, Harvard, Yale, it's um, 60 out of the 68 Oxford and Cambridge colleges now, 25 major private schools, 19 major academic libraries, 24 major cathedrals, more than 120 parish churches, seven national museums, five royal palaces, two supreme courts, and nine synagogues and a partridge part in a pear tree. tree yes, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And I'm put at the bottom of this. Um, um, it is this is all true. Actually, you mentioned the statistics earlier on about the number of projects of 2,283. Um, according to our computer database of all our invoices, that includes 105,830 pieces of furniture, um, um, and there are 1,053 global global clients. I'm surprised we're not just drowning in a sea of Luke Hughes furniture. Where is it well, all? It's, it's, it gets around a little bit, but it is also our 40th year in Covent Garden, which uh, this year, which is quite exciting because I think we've exceeded by by 10 years how long Thomas Chippendale was in was in Covent Garden. And I always wonder, as I wander up Martin, St Martin's Lane, I always look at his little, the little plaque there that's, um, uh, that, that commemorates his presence. And have you got one yet? A, a Luke no. Hughes plaque? <laughs> I have to wait till the... I'm going to wait until I'm dead, I think. Yeah. <laughs> the principal areas of these buildings, though, it tends to be because of the quantities. The problem about making residential furniture, if you make a dining chair, it's very expensive to make one chair. You need, you need batches. You can't very easily do it unless you have very, very rich private clients. So our areas, we've concentrated on academic and the public realm. There's always stuff going on in universities um, and, and institutions. A huge amount of worship buildings, buildings of worship, cathedrals, churches, synagogues, they're all having to rethink their spaces. They're all of huge architectural importance and they, they're very much loved and cared for by the community. But if there are too many pews and they can't actually use the building or heat it or all that kind of stuff, they've got to think about the furniture. We used to do quite a lot of corporate meeting and conference rooms, but I, we've gone off those really because it's more fun dealing with the good architecture. And we do a little bit on luxury hotels and street furniture and a very occasional private commissions, but it's mostly the, the, um, those, those, public, those, those public buildings. Was it a, was it a, a realisation? Um, at what point did you in your career or in your company's career decide that you were going to focus pretty much exclusively on public? Well, buildings? the last, last, but last major recession, but three, which was in 1990, when we thought we were doing rather well at the time, and we didn't realize that the market suddenly collapsed in, in, a, in a matter of months. Mm. Um, and we just set up a, um, um, a workshop down here in Tisbury, where I'm speaking from. Uh, um, and then we suddenly didn't have a market, but we, we all got round a table and said, well, who's gonna survive this recession? Um, answer those who've survived it before. What have they all got in common? Well, good buildings and endowment funds. What are they trying to do? They're trying to sweat their assets. So they've got to think about redoing the furniture if you want to be able to rent out your dining hall at an Oxbridge College for a conference, say. So having benches um, for that wasn't going to be um, much cop for, 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 for the conference market. But we applied that same thinking. Um, in the early days, we were clutching the yellow pages in one hand and the 
Pevsner in the other, trying to work out who had good buildings and what they were likely to be using them for. Um, and that actually saved, saved, saved the day um, uh, in those days. But actually, there are the other thing about them, they're still risk, um, recession resistant. And that's obviously helping us a lot um, in this environment. At the risk of causing you to be more arrogant than you already are, do you know of anyone else that had this kind of thinking? Any other furniture maker at that time that, that made a definite um, overt strategy to, to research and um, you know, market yourself to, to uh, owners and um, occupiers? Of well, there was one guy, called um, very nice guy, called Robert Osborne, who set up a company called Osiris. Um, he sadly died in a skiing accident 20 years ago. Um, um, but he had been at Sydney Sussex College, Cambridge, and he'd sort of concluded something similar, but he tended to go down the corporate route, the corporate boardrooms and this kind of stuff. Very, very nice guy and very, very, um, um, and very dedicated. A few people have dabbled in it, but, it's, but I think you've got to really, really know your way around the architecture. When you're designing for a Romanesque cathedral or in one or a um, sterling prize winning building the next you've really got to understand the building and what people are trying to do with it and I think I've been very lucky of having a combination of um, an arch hist architectural historical background along with being being a maker I mean, I did spend the best part of 15 years making um, um, and I, I suppose that's fairly rare um, I think it's unique actually but uh, anyway yeah What's, uh, what's next? Well, I think it's thought for the day, and this comes back to um, what, is a, um, what do we mean by um, furniture and architecture? Well, um, this is very close to us here in Tisbury, which is a tithe barn, supposedly the longest tithe barn in the country, 14th century. Um, and certainly when I was a teenager, it was still being used as a tithe barn. It's now been turned into an art gallery. It's a very beautiful space and a, they have wonderful exhibitions there, but that roof is just staggering and indeed is the whole of the volume. The interesting thing is that most churches, this is Pontigny, but there are lots of other ones around, are essentially stone barns. Uh, they may have higher windows and a higher roof, uh, but the form is actually very similar. And actually, you can wander around the ruins of Cistercian abbeys um, in France or even, in, even in, in Northern Europe as well. And they are beautiful stone spaces until you put a table in them. And then it becomes a church. And that is, I think, probably the best expression of what furniture does to an architectural space. It articulates that purpose. The height of the table, maybe it's standing or sitting or what you do around the table is almost immaterial. But as soon as you put a piece of furniture into spaces like that, you give it some kind of meaning and some kind of purpose. Conversely, of course, you can, you can, you can diminish it very quickly by putting the wrong kind of stuff in it. We've got a few examples. I think we of that. have. Um, there we go. There's a Perugia a Renaissance town hall. Somebody got some airline seats into it. I mean, it really makes you gasp and stretch your eyes. Um, how about the old polypropylene chair? I mean, I knew the old polypropylene chair. I know, but actually, in Corpus Christi College dining hall, in you know, um, mm. when we put some new furniture in it, we didn't even decorate the building, but it completely transformed yeah. the interior just by changing the furniture. Um, really? Um, this was a library which we stuck, we took and took by the scruff of the neck, um, and simply by changing the furniture, we turned it into a library. We didn't touch the building at all, um, but it's completely different language. Same purpose, but just um, by redesigning the furniture. And obviously, libraries. I love doing libraries. We've done about thirty of them now, um, but they're particularly complicated spaces um, to get really right. I mean, the polypropylene chair it goes it gets around. Um, apart from the fact they're a terrible fire risk. Here they are in Winchester Cathedral. I mean, um, this wonderful church in Devizes, Romanesque Church, St. John's St. Devizes, with those red polypropylene. I mean, what about the one top right? Now, they should be in a motorway cafe, not in a, not mm. in a small parish church. I mean, mm. it, I, I, I rest my case. I mean, you can destroy an architectural space by putting the wrong furniture um, uh, into it. 
another pause and we're going back to um the roots the covent garden roots and um you know how you started doing what you're doing well i did i actually started in lambs convict street but i had for about two years i had the back the backyard of a, of a house there when i i left university uh, but in 1981 i acquired this little building or lower half of this building i added a flat on top later on um, and in the early days, that was where it all started. It was one old banana warehouse in Covent Garden, um, uh, which after the market moved out in the late 70s, was empty and derelict. But it was perfect little workshop. And we had the machines upstairs and um, three of us downstairs and, um, um, and Christian Jeb at the time, who came to look after the admin. Um, but we were but then- you making, you were, Sorry to interrupt, you weren't making, I was just gonna say you weren't making public furniture then were you or you were well, just going to move to a slide that that next slide that was actually one of um yeah. a, a set of eight circular benches we made for harrow shopping center which is still there 30 yeah. years on yeah um, and we did we were beginning to pick up jobs for st paul's Cobham garden we did jobs for the the inns of court um um this was actually there was another one that went to went to Gray's inn but of course, we had a bit of a problem because we had to make it in the street um, in the early days. But the workshop simply wasn't big enough. Yeah. In those days, Covent Garden was actually quite easy and it wasn't, wasn't, wasn't so, so much of a problem. And we had the man next door was the man who used to run the barrows on the old fruit and veg market. And mm. for our local clients, we really did use his barrows, which was great while it lasted. Um, that's that, on the way to the British Museum. Um, but we were making slightly, you know, designer makerish stuff, um, yeah. some for rich private clients, but it's very, very hard to make a living doing, doing that. This was some stuff that I did for Liberties in the um, mid eighties. Um, and that led by accident into us being asked to design a range of bedroom furniture for, um, um, which actually was taken up by John Lewis partnership and Liberties and elsewhere called the Overload, Overload Collection, which was very much based on an arts and craft idea and don't worry too much about the designs. The really interesting was I thought that that stage that our, our um, ship had come home when I walked up Regent Street one day and we found 11 of their 12 shop windows, all with our furniture in it. Um, uh, but of course, then Marks and Spencer's ripped us off and, um, and, and made it very difficult for us to compete. Um, and I, at that point, I lost, I lost the will, really. And that's just why we began to start thinking seriously about the contract and, and public spaces rather mm. than the residential. It's jolly so retail, hard. The retail, what, um, retail will also fell prey to the recession or? or? Everything suffered in the recession. But the other thing we realized is, you know, sitting in a traffic jam, burning diesel, trying to deliver a bedside table uh, on a Friday afternoon in the, tra in the rush hour traffic was a big no-no. I mean, it, but we learned very hard um, that we needed to get out of that world. Yeah. We needed to be able to go for those batches that we're going to talk so, about. So what, what's happening here is you're moving towards um, big batch. You know, you're not yet at mass batch. But well, we've never uh, really been. Well, we have begun to be at mass batch. We were mostly, it's been, you know, batches between 10 and 100, not thousands. Um, yeah. And yeah. that really makes, that's why the technology has come our way, if you like, because those are the things that make these buildings relevant. But this stuff in Liberty's windows, you weren't making that in that little workshop in um, Stupid. I did all the prototypes in that little workshop. Um, and then we we outsourced it to, um, uh, there's a long story behind this, which um, is hinted at in the book. Um, we're about to a firm in Birmingham um, who didn't understand it at all. But um, and we ended up by taking back control of the, of the production. Um, um, but during that time, um, I did find myself talking largely through Chelsea Crafts Fair, actually, where we did rather well in the mid, mid 80s, which was organized by a wonderful lady called Philippa Powell, um, who was the wife um, um, of Philip Powell, of Powell and Moyer. And Philip liked wandering around the Chelsea Crafts Fair and he came on the stand and started looking at the furniture and said, this is all rather nice, rather good, he said. You know, uh, you know, we really struggled to find furniture to fit in all our buildings. They were doing a lot of university buildings had done in the 60s and 70s and, um, and early 80s. Cripps building at St. John's is a case in point. Um, you know, you really ought to think, but he used to love coming around the workshop um, we, on the way back. And Philip Dowson, who was actually my, my brother's father-in-law, um, he was saying exactly the same. Architects think they can design furniture, but they don't 
really understand it because they don't understand the making. He said, but you'll never be hungry if you can get the furniture to fit the building because people, they'll always want the project, the project based furniture. And at much the same time, I then bumped into Ray Lee, um, who was, ch was chairman of Gordon Russell, former chairman of Gordon Russell at that stage, who had been in practice with Dick Russell and had been very much involved with the Festival of Britain. And he was saying much the same. And in, I invited him to become our founding chairman when we turned it, the, the, the workshop into a limited company. And he was enormously influential by being able to give us access to the thinking of the 50s and 60s of people who were designing for those kinds of public public projects like the Festival of Britain and Coventry Cathedral and so on, uh, with also the link into the Cotswolds and Gordon Russell, the old former firm of Gordon Russell. Ray's still alive. Um, he's not very well at the moment, but he's incredibly influential and became a very good friend. Um, and, and enor I am enormous. I know all of them an enormous amount. They all gave me a good steer at that stage. But this begins um, to um, explain or, or uh, illustrate your relationship with architects and architecture, doesn't it? Yes, partly, but also I had read history of architecture at, at Cambridge and that, you know, so I, I knew my way around the buildings. I understood about architecture and I, um, I knew how to research them and understand their purpose. Um, and the, every 50, 60 years, buildings do need repurposing in some way. Um, anthropology moves on. Um, but you, the, the, you, can, you can make them relevant, continue to make them relevant with the furniture in ways that you can't by changing the building. Okay. I think we're on to projects, are we? We're on to projects. We've got, uh, we've got 19 minutes for five projects. Okay, well, let's burn through some projects because these are... Uh, shall we... Uh, okay, so let's... Everybody thinks we do... Everything we do is in wood. It's not true. About 60% of what we do is in wood, but a hell of lots of it's in stone, steel, metals of one kind or another, glass, you name it. This is a project where arts and some of the arts and craft principles really came to the fore. It was St. Giles Cathedral on the Royal Mile in, in Edinburgh. And we were asked to design a new um, holy table. We got to call it that with the Calvinist tradition in Scotland rather than an altar. But the then uh, minister, um, Gillespie Macmillan, wanted to make permanent um, the holy table under the, under the tower, under, under the crossing um, of the cathedral. And we ended up by agreeing that we were going to make it out of Carrara marble. And I went, had great fun going to the Carrara several times to dig out the great lumps of marble. Note this enormous chainsaw. Most stone cutting uh, machines these days are all very based on woodworking machines, which is quite interesting, but they, they still cut, cut it out with these uh, fantastic saws. And so that, this story is, is just to interrupt, sorry. This story is basically about the relationship between um, hand craftsmanship and machinery, isn't it? I mean, you couldn't- Correct. The, the, the machinery can take the labor out of the, out of the task, but it can't really do that thing that humanizes a piece of furniture when you, when you finish it off. Um, there we are selecting the blocks, but there are, you know, the, the, we can, these huge blocks coming out, note the land cruiser for scale, um, um, but they're using effectively a bandsaw, albeit running for two days on end to saw through with diamond tipped mm. uh, bits through the, through, the, th through the cutters. But by the time they've polished it up, it all can look a bit like a hotel foyer. Um, and when we were looking at the blocks, we really didn't want to do that. And the only way we could think about giving it the sparkle that we wanted, the big block, was to hand cut it or hand tool it. And Andrea here with the diamond chisel spent three weeks just, just chipping away to give this human, human effect. And we left the top polished to the sense of like Michelangelo's captives of, of, the, of, the, of, of the stone coming up from the rusticated base and then having a polished top. How long did it take to cut the block and how long did it take to hand finish it? Um, well, precisely, it's like a lot longer. A couple of days to cut, right? No, but it was certainly three weeks um, on the hand finishing. Yeah, finish. exactly. And, but this, all, is, and this is all, getting it into the church. Oh my God. Well, the, the block weighed four tons um, and the rest of the, by the, the rest of the, the steps that went with it weighed another four and a half tons. Um, so we had to get this um, caterpillar tractor into, into the cathedral, which was quite entertaining um, and get it through the doors. It all had to be, um, uh, there's a lot of engineering structures on all of that. But by the time it went in, um, it does do what we wanted it to do, which is to speak of its purpose. And that comes back to that Cistercian monastery that I showed you earlier on. But the crucial thing is the tooling. 
it's the tooling on that face. If it had just been polished, it would not do what it is clearly doing in those spaces. Whichever way you look at it, you go in, especially on a gloomy November night, and it just just floats in that space. Yeah, um, glows. But the, it's glowing because of the light coming off, reflecting in lots of different directions. Yeah. Yeah. But that is definitely down to the hand finishing. No question. I mean, that's yeah. what, what it does. You can see the difference with the polished marble on the steps and so on. Yeah. Yeah. Ely was one of the slides <laughs> illustrated in the title blocks. We started with this, which I first saw when I was an undergraduate in the mid 70s. And I couldn't believe that anybody would accept something as mundane in the middle of that wonderful octagonal space at Ely. But it took a long time. Uh, but eventually we did get a call about two, three years ago. Uh, to see if we would like to look at that and I, I could have um, jumped for joy it was such a wonderful thing but the scale of working in some of these buildings is is really quite daunting it's massive the the octagon um, that huge space and the 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 dais that we were working there is nine meters across I and mean, it gives you an idea of the scale of all of that but we had a lot of fun this shows you a little bit how we were working and making models to see how it would build up but it wasn't just building up the the altar and the um clergy furniture and the, but also the choir and how you move it how you move it in a hurry with one verger um so that you can clear it away for all the other kinds of services so that was part of the brief it had to be demountable we had to clear it in 20 minutes was the idea yeah exactly the whole thing and for those who are interested yes we do do full-size mock-ups firstly in 2d and we even got the dean on a chair just to check check the scale of, of all of that and then looked at it from different sides of the building and then we made a full-size plywood mock-up um, and eventually this is what we ended up with um, so there's a set of furniture and a breathtaking romanesque nave um, and we picked up some choir stalls which we designed very much in the spirit to go with that that musical rhythm of the architectural work and those columns mm -hmm. um, um, but you'll also see colour is colour in the octagon, colour in the glass, colour in the stonework. Mm. Um, and we knew we had to do something which left the high altar still speaking of its purpose. Yeah. Even though this was obviously a, a nave in the body of the congregation in, 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 in the nave. Mm. Um, quite like, there's a lot of technical stuff and I haven't got time to go on, on about it, but actually the language works works pretty well. Um, I'm very pleased with it. We loosed the chair, the bishop's chair is loosely, um, a loosely a nod to Charlemagne's throne at Arkham, mm. um, which he supposedly um, stole from Ravenna from where Justinian had, had installed it um, originally. Um, but we've got very good craftsmen who do the signing and the turning and all those other little details as well. This was actually painted by Philip Suri, another member of the Art Workers Guild, which is quite a good network for those things. The altar, people are always curious how it went together because it's quite a piece of, of, of cabinet making. Um, but the other thing is it, you can see the engineering that goes underneath it, the, um, all the bearings. Uh, these are actually the, the, the casters that they use in the National Theatre for moving the sets around, but they glide very, very easily. Um, and so that's what we've done there. And one of the things we were really conscious about was how we were going to get the thing to read when you're at the very far west end. It's a good, you know, 150 feet away. It's a long, long, long nave. And I suddenly hit, we needed to get some gold, some gold into it. It's the only thing I could really think of. But why not pick up the story of why Ely was wealthy in the first place, which is eels. They had the monopoly on eels in East Anglia and in a Catholic uh, um, uh, millennium when um, you couldn't eat fish on Fridays and all the holy days and so on. So eels were, had a real premium value. That is why Ely is as rich. So we thought we'd abstract the eels and carve them all the way around the rim of the altar. And this is Georgi Makatuchian, another member of the Art Workers Guild, as it happens, who carved the eels. And then we gilded them. Um, Philip Shorey doing, and John Madison was doing the painting, picking up the stonework and so on in the altar. Um, and that's the finished result. That is just an amazing piece of craftsmanship. And as you say, uh, also about the St. Giles piece, that it does, it, it, you know, it's uplifting just to see it, even in, even in, um, in a, in a slide like this. But to be in that, be in that space, you know, it just, it really does speak to the space and the space to it. It's an amazing piece of work, Luke. Well, it's definitely worth spending the time on the prototype. The thing you can do with furniture, which you can't do with architecture, of course, is make prototypes, endless prototypes. 
Yeah. Um, I mean, the setting out of that, the geometry on that is incredibly complex. And I, I can't imagine anything more uh, difficult to make than that. Well, um, I mean, the computers help, but it's it, yeah. it doesn't stop, you know, when you get down to that sense, you can see Georgi's chisel mark still on the on the eels. Um, mm -hmm. And it really does sparkle, um, especially on the cold November night, you know, when you're at the far end and you suddenly, it really draws your eye in. Um, but it had been done with without um, sophisticated computer driven machinery, do you think? Well, probably, been? yes. But I mean, it would have been very difficult to draw. Um, uh, it's very difficult to draw in a conventional way. Um, um, but I mean, all of these things you can, can draw it. I mean, I, when I was making furniture on my own, I tended not, not to do very many drawings. I just used to make it because I could had it all in my head. But that mm. you can do, but when you're instructing other people, which is what we are now doing all around the world, um, we have to be much more specific. But the, the importance of draftsmanship, I mean, I still live off sketches, um, uh, which I photographed and sent to my team who turned it into a CAD drawing. That still works but you've got to control the drawing. The drawing is absolutely key, and, yeah. Um, yeah. never more so. Um, Can you keep moving? Okay, Sainsbury. Well, that's another one, which was, this is um, it's an incredible building. It won the Sterling Prize of the year. It was open in 2010. It then won the Sterling of the Sterling of all the Sterling Prizes. It's a phenomenal building by Stanton Williams in the Botanic Gardens and funded by, by David Sainsbury's um, um, Institute, but we designed every stick of furniture in this. Um, and right from the outset, Stanton Williams, who of course, um, Paul Williams has designed quite a lot of exhibitions for the VNA, um, but, it, but right from the outset, they were seeing the furniture as part of the architecture in a very different way. Um, these are some of the sessions, there's Gavin Henderson, we were working on the models with the furniture, but how it was going to read to the glazing, glazing bars. And there's Alan Stanton, who is in, um, is in a wheelchair, but came up to the factory we, the, who, where we made this in Birmingham. A lot of steel work. Because steel, welding steel and getting the welds in the right places and the joints in the right places is just as complex as doing it in wood. Everybody thinks just because it's in steel, there's no craftsmanship involved. Um, but the guy on the bottom left there, he was the guy who did all the, all the, all the steel work in all the furniture. And it was a phenomenal achievement. Um, and you'll see, as you'll see, there's a very camp photograph of Alan testing out the, um, testing out the upholstery on, um, on the bottom right. I think this the, one, I mean, one of the reasons, I think everyone should know, one of the reasons why we chose this particular project was because, you know, a lot of it is about your relationship with the architects, but it's also about the architect's relationship to craft and viewing the whole building furniture included as a work of craftsmanship and that is something that 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 those particular architects standard Stanton Williams I think it it sets them apart actually I think so they're there, there are others like I mean you know the allies and Morrisons and Hopkins of this world and and, and Eric Parry and so on who get mm. it the same way but they are very good to work with and mm. um it's been a very harmonious relationship um, we've done several projects with them but you get also the control of the detailing, but all of that is hand finished, never mind whether it's stainless steel or leather or oak, but you can see the control is going through, even down to us dyeing the hides of leather to the same color as the glazing bars, yeah. um, uh, as the stanchions that, that are all the way along there. But you do get that sense of the furniture fitting the building. It's the kind of thing that you would expect from some of the Danes in the eight, 1950s and so on. Um, um, but you get the idea of this. It was a marvellous project to, to work on. Those are not Luke Hughes chairs, are they? No, the, neither of them are. No, one of them's a, a chair from Spain and the other's from, from Italy. But um, we, couldn't, we couldn't make those for, for the small batches. Yeah. But we struggled. We, God, we struggled. But we did end up by getting them covered in the same leather with the same colour to match all the rest of the building. Mm. It also mm. worked, worked pretty well. Um, now here's another one, which is a bit of a story, um, which is the Chapel of the Resurrection in Valparaiso, Indiana. An homage, an homage. An homage, it really is, here it is. And it's an extraordinary building. It's opened in 1960, two years before, guess what? Um, it's rather marvelous building in, in some ways. I love this, this treatment, um, an incredible window at the far end with the Angel of the Resurrection and so on. But it is, of course, a knockoff of Coventry Cathedral. <laughs> and there is Coventry top and left. You speak, Luke, you know, I think we're well, talking homage, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> well, you wait. Um, but the, the, obviously it hasn't got the Piper window um, um, or, or those, um, some of the other. Um, 
but mm. th there is the, the building on the bottom right. But look at the footprint. Mm. Uh, there's Coventry on the left, um, yeah. and you'll see the Chapel of Unity has been moved up to the east end. Yeah. But otherwise, the arrangement of light coming in from the side um, has been extended. It's almost doubled in doubled in length. Mm. There's no question where where the origins come from. I yeah. think what actually happened was that Basil Spence published the designs for Coventry in fifty or fifty one, and he didn't finish it because they were short of money until nineteen sixty two. Well, Charles mm. Stader, who was the architect of Valparaiso. Um, started building in 1959 and finished in 1961. So it was a year earlier than, mm. than earlier than Coventry Cathedral. I may have slightly got the dates wrong, but not not by much. Um, but they had pews, there, huge pews, which they couldn't move. And of course, this is the biggest building. They had a 2,000 seat building. Um, if they couldn't use the building for more than um, the services on Sunday, it was really a um, 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 huge, um, a greatly wasted opportunity. And what we just, they, then they contacted the Gordon Russell Trust Museum actually, and said, look, we quite like the Coventry Cathedral chair, um, who, who could do it for us? And Ray Lee put them in touch with me and said, well, I think the only person we know who could probably put it back into production would be Luke Hughes and company. Um, but there's a bit of a problem with the, the diets have changed a little since 1959 and the Coventry Cathedral chair wartime austerity and all of that was a bit was a bit narrow um, so we had to beef it all up but while we were looking at, re, 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 at reviving the design which is essentially Dick Russell's design um, we did actually meet up with Anthony Blee who had been the project architect on Coventry and here he is he's 90 something now with his uh, with his daughter and he married Basil Spence's daughter um, kept it in the office but it was absolutely fantastic to get first-hand knowledge of that whole of that experience and why the chair mattered so much to the building at Coventry, because it does express something so much of, um, of its architecture. Um, it is a classic. I mean, the first run, were, were, I think, were slightly, un slightly uncomfortable. We've improved the comfort and we've improved the, the size so you, we can deal with it. But getting it into production, we were able to do things now with computers and com computer numerically controlled machines, which simply were not possible in 1960s mm. when, they, when they first did it. Mm. Um, and we were able to, the, the factory we used actually in Central Europe was very close to the forest where we got the oak. So we were able to cut out all the middlemen um, who would, all the timber merchants, et cetera, um, to get the chair back into production. Um, and it looks superb in that building. It's absolutely right for that particular type of 50s, 60s architecture. Um, and um, uh, they're obviously thrilled to bits. We made um, 15, 15, 1600, I think, altogether. You know, the, there there we have, well, it's certainly mass batch. Would you even call that mass production, 1500? Well, I, we're not, yes, but it's very project specific. You know, we're not making 3,000 or 10,000 mm. or 30,000, mm. or like the polypropylene chair, which have been turned out by the hundreds of thousands. Yeah. We're not doing it on that level. But we are able to make stuff and design stuff which is project specific and make it at a rate which is still viable. Yeah, uh, that really was much harder 30 years ago um, than it is now. Yep. And I think the last project is. Uh, is we're running a little bit so, that, isn't it? I hope everybody's not getting too bored. Right. The Keystone Academy, Beijing, talk about the advantages of smartphones. Very quickly, I'll take you through this. This is quite a cultural journey. Um, Ding Shi is the um, Chinese name for Keystone Academy. And I first was asked to go out and look at it um, in 2013 when they were throwing up the concrete, um, saying they were going to be open the following summer. And I really had to gasp and stretch my eyes about that. I couldn't believe that it would be, be done. And I met a lot of the Chinese um, uh, faculty um, and the Chinese um, trustees. And there was very clear and the books of the librarian um, were a very good indicator of what they were trying to achieve, which was um, international school with a Chinese thread tapping into the best of the Western traditions. And on her bookshelf was the Tao Te Ching, Robert Frost's poems, Khalil Gibran, you name it, everything, um, uh, Bertrand Russell and so on. I mean, it was, and I just felt that I'd come home really in all kinds of ways. Um, 
And I, this, the building that they did throw up was ghastly. Um, um, and the principal said, look, we've, we're an international school on this kind of level. We've got to do better than plastic laminate walls um, and junky furniture. So he invited me back at the end of 2015 um, and uh, asked me to come up with a scheme to get the library at least up to a level that would be suitable for students who might be going on to university in America or UK. And I came back from Beijing to the V&A to see this exhibition on silk paintings. Uh, this extraordinary, one of which was designed by Paul Williams, as it happens, but the, one of the most extraordinary things they have there is this is 12 foot long um, uh, silk painting, uh, Prosperous Sujot. And if you look up top right here, here was the furniture being carried down the down the streets with the chairs being delivered as well. And I thought, gosh, this is meant to be, and included this wonderful Ming Dynasty scholar falling asleep over his books. And I thought, ah, I know where we're going with this. Um, it has to be. But the library is very big. I mean, but if you've got 2000 meters of shelving, we've got 150 chairs, we've got 12 readers tables and God knows what else besides. It's a big and complicated process. And we only had four months to design, develop and dispatch all of this to get it out to Beijing by August to get it installed for the start of the new academic year. Well, we went into overdrive um, with every workshop we could muster. It was all made in the UK. We had about 20 workshops up and down the country. Um, um, all we were coordinating the um, through our iPhones, I may say, we were coordinating the logistics, we were coordinating the timber, the colors, everything else. Everything had to be designed so it could go into this lift, this single lift shaft um, um, as well. So it more or less had to be flat pack. Um, so it was a pretty complex um, engineering feat, but especially to do it in four months from a blank sheet of paper. Um, and we even planned exactly how we were going to pack the containers so we could talk to the customs officials in Beijing. So we knew which bit had to be unloaded first. Um, and um, the, the graphics obviously tell the, tell the story, but we couldn't have done this without the computers. We were packing all the ironmongery, there's Liz was packing all the boxes and labeling them up. But amazingly, the first truck arrived 15 minutes earlier than we had predicted in, in January earlier that year. Um, and the Chinese rang me, the Chinese project manager rang me up and he said, I said, I thought the Germans were supposed to be efficient. He said, but this is amazing. Um, so there we were, and you now go in to the new Chinese um, library. That I, need to stop you. I need to interrupt you. No, no Chinese manufacturing at all, all from- Not on this one, no. Um, we have done Chinese manufacture since, but mm -hmm. we couldn't have done it and got, got used to working with them. We have got some, I mean, I've visited about 20 factories in China, but they can't do this kind of scale, you know, on that kind of um, quality. Um, without very, very clear engineering um, uh, tolerances given to them. And, you know, it's, yeah. it's a long time. But we had our network of workshops up and down the country, and we kept yeah. everybody very busy, um, and it worked very well. There's a bit of a story about the dragon, the door handles. We decided that actually we needed to do something that was a bit different. Um, and all the way over China, as indeed in North Wales, dragons are common to both to both cultures. And we invited Jill Watson, who's a sculptor, to make these wonderful um, dragon door handles um, uh, because dragons don't exist, but they sort of seem to be necessary to be invented. So now what they are, of course, is a symbol of the unknown and, the, and you fear the unknown. And of course, knowledge is a gateway to, to, to the known. Um, is that one Welsh and one Chinese dragon? There's one Welsh dragon um, on the left, which has got the wings because Chinese dragons don't fly. Okay. Uh, but, but the Welsh, but the Chinese dragons have got um, five claws and they're defending the conch shell, which um, there's a whole culture of dragons right. um, 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 on, on, on the right. Um, but you go in and we've got calligraphy from a Chinese, uh, Dong Han, um, who actually did the calligraphy behind me here in the library uh, where I'm speaking from, and calligraphy by Caroline Webb, um, a letter cutter in, um, in, in England. And it's a three-way pun of a quotation from um, um, uh, a Scottish philosopher um, who's escaped me just at the moment. 
um, by leaves we live, by leaves of books we live, by leaves of pages of books we, we live, by leaves of trees we live, and by departures we grow, which was a good idea for the symbolism for a library. And we've had it translated into Chinese, and we've got two, two of the puns translated in the, in, in the characters. But So we're doing this mix, if you like, of the East and West. There's Dong Han doing his calligraphy, and there's Caroline, who sadly died um, um, a few months ago. Um, um, on the on the right, but you'll recognise the Ming Dynasty scholars' table. Um, uh, but we carried the theme through with the lighting, with the screens, the artwork. Um, we had these boring co concrete columns everywhere, so we decided to put pictures of libraries all the way around the world on those various columns. Um, um, this is one actually in in in, in Korea. Um, and you'll, again, you'll see the shadows of the table on the left, which shows the, 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 Ming, the Ming touch. And the character who's actually behind me on, on, um, on my left is also on the walls at Keystone because it's the patron saint of Chinese carpenters who is called Lu Ban. And it's a pun on my name, Lu Ke, which the Chinese call me. Um, uh, but he's ended up there as well. And he's much loved in China. Um, what about the colors? Tell us about the, well, the color. The color. The colours are loose. Well, I mean, they do actually come more or less off the um, the colours you'll find in Chinese temples. It's a it's a sort of song, song yellow. We didn't quite get the yellow as as as, as good as I'd have liked, uh, but the red worked very well, and so did the blue. And that seems to they, they are colours that you'll find in a lot of the Buddhist temples all over China and in indeed Tibet. See, this is interior design, isn't it, Luke? It's not just... Well, it is and it isn't. I mean, libraries are complicated spaces because they need to work. They need to work to enable kids to be able to study there. And there's a difference between a law library, when people all tend to stand up, flick through the books and put it away, with an, you know, a, a library for IB students who are working collaboratively. Mm. Um, it needs to work as, a, as an entity. And it's not given... I mean, we've done 30 libraries. There aren't many architects, people will design a library into or a library space into a building. But that's not quite the same. Exactly what height are the bookshelves? Exactly what do you do with the lighting? Exactly what do you do about the cable management in the tables so that people can actually charge their laptops and all of that? How do you manage the return of the books and so on? That is quite complex, but we've done a lot of it over the years um, and we got better. The kids love it. And this actually was the expression of one of the students um, when she came in they all um, the librarian got um, a very fine lady called uh, Song Jingming who brought um, brought all her students to get the books in from the other from the other library uh, but they they've been absolutely great so I think that's the last project that it. is slightly over the hour I'm so sorry we've gone over a bit more but I hope that's not um, um, I will just say by way of a plug um, and I, you may be able to get these later on, or if not, I'm sure we can arrange to send them to you. There's some very short videos of all about three, four minutes. The really interesting one is the reviving of the Coventry chair, um, um, which has got, got it, it, you can see it in production, but you'll also see on a separate one, an interview that I did with, with Trevor Chin, who had been the production manager at Gordon Russell in the 60s when they made the first batch. He was, was 92 when I did the interview with him, but it's very touching and it's lovely to make that connection because of this, again, that furniture in architecture um, side of things. I think I'm back to, back to you, Kate. Sorry, well, we slightly overran. Thank you so much, uh, Luke and Aidan. That was really great. Um, it's intriguing to hear about your philosophy and how it's fed into, your, into the work of the company and really, really inspiring to see the work you've achieved. So thank you so much for that presentation. I thought it was fantastic. And I'm going to give you a short break now um, while uh, 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 questions come in. So if you have a question for Luke or Aidan, please use the chat box and I will um, read them out. But we're just going to give you a short break while um, I uh, tell you about upcoming lectures. And I also wanted to... Um, show you this slide uh, because Thames and Hudson are offering the book at 25% off when you quote the code FHS, sorry, FH, Furniture History Society, FHS 25. And you can see this here on the screen when you buy it from the Thames and Hudson website. So please make a note of the code if you'd like to buy the book. Or if you forget to uh, jot it down, you can email Beatrice, our event secretary, and ask her for it. So, um, FHS 25 is the code. So Luke, if you could just uh, take us on to the next slide, please. Yeah, sure. 
So we have several interesting online events coming up soon. Our next Sunday lecture will be on the 21st of February by Dr. Rebecca Tillis of the Hillwood Estate Museum in Washington, DC. Um, Marjorie Merriweather Post, a businesswoman and collector, bought Hillwood in the 1950s and filled it with her collection of French and Russian art. And after she died in 1973, the house was opened as a museum by the Post Foundation. Dr. Tillis will talk about some of the highlights at Hillwood, which reveal Marjorie Mer Merriweather Post's taste for 18th century European furniture. So that's, that looks very promising indeed. And I'd like to flag up quickly a couple more dates for your diary. A lecture arranged by the Decorative Arts Society on the 28th of February by Elizabeth Bogdan on the Wiener Werkstatter Commerce and Collaboration 1903 to 1918. And this lecture is free of charge and FHS members have already received a Zoom link with, um, with, within the notice of today's lecture. For non-members, please see the DAS website for how to obtain the Zoom link. And on Sunday, the 7th of March, Annabelle Westman will be giving us a lecture on upholstery arranged in association with the Attingham Trust entitled, What Tone is Salmon Colored? Interpreting Documentation in Historic Textile Furnishing Schemes. So please look out for the email notice about that with a Zoom link in it. And just to mention that as a sequel to Rebecca's lecture on the collections at Hillwood, uh, much later on, on the 25th of April, we'll have a second lecture about Hillwood, concentrating on the Russian furniture, given by the curator of 19th century furniture, Wilfried Zeisler. So, uh, Luke and Aidan, we'd now like you to take some uh, questions. Oh, we've lost Aidan. Oh, he's coming back. Great, oh, that's great. Um, so, if you could turn off the PowerPoint, I think that would help. Yeah, sure. Hang on a second. There we go. <clears throat> Okay. Gosh, okay. A lot of questions. Has asked a question. Ah, okay. Is there any way of... Um, oh, well, I think we'll leave it at that. It's, it's, it's no point playing around with it, but I think people can see us anyway. Hmm. If you can make us slightly bigger, Luke, that would help. Ah, okay. <laughs> Doesn't matter if you can't. Okay, so Janet Goff has asked an interesting question. So, fascinating conversation, Luke and Aidan. From a church perspective, and even today there are 16 thousand Anglican parish churches in England, there was a complete revolution in the 19th century in the wholesale introduction of pews, and today's revolution is in reverse, wanting, to trans uh, wanting a transformable space. Would you agree that the huge challenge now is how to maintain the gravity, articulation, and even sanctity of churches with movable furniture? Um, completely and utterly. I think it's a real problem, and I think that the, actually we owe a we owe the pews really to the Reformation and the need to sit there and listen to rather boring sermons that went on too long. Um, and I think it, uh, it really starts getting in earnest in the 17th century. Um, but of course, the trouble is about chairs in churches. They tend to be made by the, um, the healthcare industry, the people who are making stuff for healthcare homes. And so most of the chairs that are available in churches look as though they've come out of a healthcare area. But it's a real sadness because one of the biggest problems with churches is that they use a lot of chairs and they, chairs are very busy. If you put 100 or 200 or 300 into a church, well, there's lots of verticals all over the place and you know, electric blue upholstery and God knows what else besides. It's a nightmare. It looks absolutely diminishes the architecture. Though there's interior landscapes, most of which are absolutely stunning in so many churches and cathedrals. It's the case in point. Um, we hit on an idea about 25 years ago, um, which struck me as pretty odd that nobody had ever thought about it before, of stacking pews. Because now with the modern engineering, you can get them to stack, you can get them to stay together, and you create a very calm horizontal, which is more or less what pews look like. But the biggest problem was you couldn't move them. And a lot of that came with um, changes of the Oxford movement and indeed the industrial revolution enabled people not only to make long pews and but also deliver them because with railways and canals and so on, you could get the stuff um, um, uh, moved around the country and, and everybody did. And it's, it is a real problem because unless churches can be used to be proved to be relevant like the Valparaiso Chapel in Indiana, um, they will they will die on their feet, and it's a real problem. If you're sixteen thousand, I think of those are just the ones that are listed. I mean, it's a vast problem. 
So my own view is I much prefer pews in, 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 in churches, but you can design them so we can clear them away. I don't like chairs in churches much, but I do recognize in cathedrals, um, they, are, they are suitable because you have many more concerts and, um, and that kind of thing. But it's quite interesting in Catholic churches in, in Europe, you'll see that they'll pew the middle of a nave and then fill in with chairs which they can clear away most of the time around the outside. But it does have a huge impact, Janet, about on, on the architecture, um, as, I think, as I think you know. <laughs> a quick one just for Janet, um, just from me, Janet, which is, I think you've only got to look at some of the work of Luke Hughes in some of the churches. I, I don't think uh, gravity, articulation and sanctity um, in, any of, uh, in any of the installations that Luke's put, um, put furniture suffer. You know, I think that, uh, and as we all know, um, the function of churches is changing and continues to change. They have to be multifunctional spaces now. Um, there's a story about uh, Sheffield, which is in the book, um, Sheffield Cathedral, where part of the brief to Luke was that um, tramps and homeless people come in and sleep here and we want them to be to, to mm. continue to do so. So, you know, the way that the way that churches are being are being used now, are being responded to, is is very different from, obviously, from their original design. But um, I don't have any uh, speaking as uh, not as a Christian, but as the son of a of a Church of England priest. I don't have any um, doubt at all that, uh, that certainly the Luke Hughes work, and I think some other modern makers manage to maintain the gravity of which you speak. I might just add, actually, we were incredibly moved to see uh, St John's Notting Hill after the Grenfell fire. And they were they offered the church for people who were, were evacuated from from the building, and they'd actually put the pews seats together and were all sleeping on them, and it was an emergency. I, I was so moved by this. I, suddenly, that's exactly the, like the you know the vaccinations in Lichfield or Salisbury. I mean, suddenly using churches in that in that way was 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 was, was really terrific. They wouldn't have been able to do that with the Victorian pews. Mm -hmm. um. <coughs> Thanks very much. That's great. Um, Clarissa Ward asks, uh, well, she says, fascinating talk. Thank you both. Um, then Luke, which 19th century designer or maker do you feel most, you, you most take stylistic inspiration from? Ah. If, if any. <laughs> no, it's interesting because um, 19th century. Shift centuries, go to the 18th. Well, I mean, early Chippendale, I mean, a lot of that early Huguenot, um, uh, you know, the, the, I think the 1700 to 1730 is certainly one of my favorite periods. But it, one of the reasons is that the furniture designs tended to come out of the maker's mind and off his tools. And they have an integrity of it, which is almost a kind of forerunner of what later happens with the art work, arts and craft movement in the 1880s and onwards. The architects start sort of muscling in about 1750 in particular. You think of what Adam was doing for his buildings or Thomas Hope or some or, or chambers and so on. And it all got rather mannered and rather prissy um, and, um, you know, quite fine. But it's not, it doesn't have that sort of gutsiness that, that, that the 17, 1720s, 1730s does. And I'm sure it's to do with the types of the craftsmen who were making it. You know, Covent Garden is supposed to have had 200 workshops at that time. And I'm sure they were all, you know, they knew exactly what the pull was on their spoke shave, how they could or carve that particular um, club, club, um, club foot on, 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 on a chair. Um, so 19th century, do you know, one of the people I really admire was, um, um, oh, I'm having a senior moment now. Um, <laughs> Tell them about Mike Johnson. Oh, I will tell you, okay, well, he's not a 19th century one. He's not 19th century. <laughs> okay, this is, uh, Aidan has fed me the line. I became a maker, really, because from the age of, age of 12, I started sweeping up in school holidays for a harpsichord maker who's still alive. He's 93 now, I think. And I, um, I gave him a copy of the book the other day, 50 years late, I may say, to say thank you for what he taught me. But he was a maker of harpsichords, and I used to go along in my school holidays and sweep up for him and for a guitar maker called Jose Romanios, who, um, who was making guitars for Julian Bream at that time. And I didn't realize just how special those holiday periods were. 
and until really until the last couple of years when I suddenly realized that actually it's so much of what the techniques I still use have come from that musical tradition. But Mike was one of the most phenomenal craftsmen I've ever met. Um, and he, I, when I went to see him uh, just before the book came out, he was just finished his 200th harpsichord. I mean, I was there when he made his first one in about 19, 1968, 69. It was a very moving story, but um, anyway, all, all, power to, all power to him. Thank you very much. We've got a completely different question here from Emma Sheridan. He says, hello, really fantastic work. Uh, this might seem a little off topic, um, not furniture and architecture, but, but more what we're surrounded by. And she wonders whether either of you could recommend a historic example any historic examples of fantastically interesting street furniture? To look into. You know, every, every time I walk down the embankment on, um, um, I mean, it's everything that Morris would have railed against, but I love those, those cast iron benches that are um, on, 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 on the embankment. They, they have a kind of oomph to them, which uh, Basiljet, I'm sure, had, you know, when he's part of his designs. Um, there's some very good architecture, architectural elements of street furniture all the way down the embankment. I mean, when was the embankment? Um, 1860, roughly, um, thereabouts. But they are good and they, they've lasted extremely well. Um, I'm just trying to think other street furniture. I mean, it's not quite street furniture, but you know those gasoliers you see in cathedrals? They, they, now, they now put gas in them, but they used to have coal in them as, in, instead. They're marvelous industrial fins that they look as about they about to take off and go off to outer space. Chester's still got some, Salisbury's still got a couple, I think. Hereford's still got some as well. Um, but they are very much a uh, taking of the products of the Industrial Revolution and making something beautiful out of the necessity to, of course, until you could heat cathedral, it's almost impossible to stay there on a Sunday morning and stay for a service. Um, just trying to think of other street furniture. I mean, there's some Roman, wonderful Roman and Greek stuff. You see it's carved in stone and I, uh, you see it in Epidavros. There's some very good, all the benches, the way that they're articulated um, into, the, into the hillside. Um, there's some at Pompeii I remember seeing, seeing there as well. Um, um, I think I need notice of that question. How am I doing? <laughs> I was thinking about embankment as well, actually. My mind went straight to embankment. Yeah, industrial processes. So one, just one more, I think we have time for, um, which is, um, uh, Madeline Lightfoot says, um, she loves the color of the Ely Cathedral. Um, why, um, uh, loves the color of the altar. Why not the other? Uh, very, very good point. Actually, we did have a lot of discussion about this and I had a scheme for painting the front of the choir stalls um, uh, with a subdued color. But a lot of it revolved around the liturgical emphasis. The only three pieces of furniture you need in, a, in an ecclesiastical building are the altar, the font, and the lectern, or the, or, or the pulpit. And you can still recognize archeological remains of churches and recognize them as churches because of the foundation stones of those three pieces. Everything else is, um, is extra. And the key, obviously, should be as you come in on the west, from the west end, you have the font, and there's the spiritual journey from the um, admission into the church um, to the altar by way of the word, which is, um, what, where, which is why the pulpit was there. So you, we, we, we did talk about it uh, at, at Ely, but everybody decided actually a bit of attention anyway, because there's the high altar at the very far end, which has got quite a lot of bling and gold. And you do see it right the way through. And we needed to give something, it was a focal point for the liturgy under the octagon. Um, but we didn't want to divert attention from that in, with the choir stalls and the clergy furniture. But I, I completely understand the reason why you might ask the question. I, I was quite keen to, to add some paint, um, but the getting the right color was really tricky. And thank God for John Madison, who, ha, who knows the building very well, but he, he, we worked very hard to get it, uh, doing the mock-up and actually checking the colors and everything else. So I hope that answers the question. And sorry, I think there's one more, <laughs> just to pray on your time a little bit more, because uh, David Oakey, my co-chair, has asked a really interesting question. Uh, so this will have to be the last one, I think. Um, she, he says, thank you so much for a really fabulous talk stroke discussion. Would you say you adhere to Pugin's principle of revealed construction in your furniture? Um, whenever I can, but I have to say I have cheated occasionally. <laughs> but you're right. I mean, I'm doing a job at the moment um, 
Uh, well, we did a job, for instance, in the Tower of London for the St. John's Chapel, uh, which is, you know, incredible, heavy numbers of tourists that go through it every year. It's very damp and humid, as you can imagine, in a Romanesque building. But they do turn it round for the Eucharist service on, on, on Sundays. But we did peg all the joints and we did leave all the pegs showing. I love that integrity to it all. Um, I don't like hiding things in, in, in furniture construction. Sometimes you've just got to, though. I mean, you know, veneers are a case in point. But there are, it is right to use veneers on particle board rather than use solid timber sometimes, um, as long as it's appropriate for the, for, for the setting. But in principle, yes, I absolutely do, 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 do um, approve of that. And we do try very hard, and especially when I'm training up younger designers, you know, be honest about it. Celebrate the joints. Celebrate the celebrate the the raw materials. Don't hide things. Well, that's absolutely great. Thanks very much. And um, well, thank you both. Aidan, do you have anything to add, or you have? No, add? thank you very much uh, for uh, for the chance for us to. Yeah, thank you so much, Kate, and thank you very much to, to uh, the FHS. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah well, and if anybody wants to follow up, do please do so. I mean, um, would you, would, do, do, shall I send you the links of those of those little videos? Would they be useful? Well, that would be great. And I think we'll we'll find a way of uh, sending those out to our members because I think that would be fascinating for people. And Trevor Chin interview is, is, is charming, actually. He's so nice. And it's just marvellous making that connection over, well, it's, it's already 60 years since they did it. And it's just m m wonderful to get that oral history. I suppose there's one thing I'd say with all of this, though, and it goes right way back to 1884 and beyond. There are very few individuals who've kept the baton going. And it's amazing how interconnected they all are. Um, and um, I, I, it's been a real joy, actually, being lucky enough to have, have met and um, heard people talk about that in this way. And I do think that's a very good reason why one should talk about it for the next generation. Absolutely. Mm. Thank you. Well, thanks very much again. And thanks to everyone who's Thank attended you, this event. Um, thanks also to my co-chair, David Oakey, and our event secretary, Beatrice Goddard, for their work in putting on these lectures. So um, enjoy the rest of your evening, afternoon or morning, and take care, stay safe, and we'll see you next time. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye.